To understand SQL injection, you have to know what SQL is. I've created another video explaining, and I'd recommend watching that one before watching this video. SQL injection is a type of cyber attack where an attacker inserts valid SQL code into a database through a website's input field. This allows an attacker to gain unauthorized access to the database, potentially giving them access to sensitive information such as names and passwords. You've probably heard all this before, but how do you perform an SQL injection attack? How can you bypass authentication mechanisms? How can you check for vulnerable SQL parameters? How do you check what tables, fields, and records exist in the database? This is what I'll demonstrate to you and give you real understanding. Before we get into it, it's important to note that SQL injection is illegal to perform on systems you have no permission to do so on. Be very careful where you attempt SQL injection and what queries you're running against the database. The first step is to find a vulnerable input field on the web application. Let's say we're logging into a system we might see a username and password field. These fields directly authenticate by comparing the input credentials with the stored credentials of the backend database. In this example, we've hashed the original password to ensure no passwords are stored in the database. The database will look for the record and return true to the web application if the record exists. To check for an SQL injectable parameter, we can simply add a single quote to the input field and observe the result that's returned to us. If the database returns an error, this is a clear sign of a vulnerable SQL parameter. But why is this? Let me explain. When a single quote is inputted into the web application's parameter, the single quote is being parsed as SQL, not as the actual character, single quote. We don't know how the backend SQL query is structured, but we can take some educated guesses and directly query the database to find out if our guesses are correct or not. For example, suppose we have a login form and we are using an SQL query to check the username and password fields of someone trying to authenticate. Here, the SQL code observes the single quote after test and then immediately after sees another single quote, making the and password SQL statement into a string instead of valid SQL. This breaks the query and the backend database doesn't know how to parse this information. It returns an error to the screen. Great, we've now discovered a vulnerable SQL parameter. But how do we get more information out of this? How do we stop the query from being malformed and control it to execute our own code? We need to make the malformed query valid again. Just like other programming languages, SQL provides the ability to comment out code at the end of lines. If we can make the backend system think that the rest of the query is just a comment left for other developers and should not be parsed by the application, we can restructure the SQL query to be valid again. To do this, we can comment out the rest of the code after the single quote we inputted. We also need to terminate the SQL query by using a semicolon. Without this, the query may break. As we can see, this has caused the invalid SQL syntax past the single quote to be seen as a comment and should not be ran as part of the SQL query. SQL injection is black box testing. It completely comes down to how the programmer has specified the query to be ran as of to how the application will respond. For this reason, I recommend trying everything you can and build up your own understanding and list of valid queries. There are three common types of SQL injection attack, authentication bypass, union injection, and blind SQL injection. Within authentication bypass, one way that an attacker can use SQL injection is by inserting a special string into the username or password field that is always considered to be true by the authentication system. For example, suppose a login form has the following SQL query for fetching the username and password of a user. What we need to envision here is how the backend database is talking with the web application. The web application forwards our request to the database system to check our credentials. If the credentials are correct, the database will return a Boolean value of true. This Boolean value gets sent to the web application and the web application authenticates us against the web server, giving us access to the system. So what do we have to do to get the database to return a value of true without knowing any of the user details on the database? The way we do this is by sending the database a query that is always returned as true, like so. Here, we're using the OR operator to add a condition to the original SQL query and manipulate it to be a value that's always true. The resulting SQL pseudo query could look something like this. This query will always return the result of at least one row because the condition one equals one is always true. As a result, the attacker would be able to log in without knowing the correct username and password for anyone in the database. In this example, I restructured the SQL query instead of commenting it out to demonstrate a different way that you can structure SQL injected queries. The standard way, which can be easier, is to do the following. Here, we're commenting out the rest of the query and making it valid ourselves. Both ways work well. However, as I've said before, depending on how the developer has set up the backend system and which database management system is in use, it won't always work the same. For instance, MySQL requires a space after a comment to act as a control character or it won't count the comment as valid SQL. 
This means if we set the query up like so, the end quote won't have a white space character and would prevent the comment characters from parsing as a comment character. It's important to note that even knowing this, there are many variants which might be correct for getting SQL injection to execute and gain access, as statements and applications can be drawn up in a variety of different ways. Check out my GitHub if you're looking for a more exhaustive list of ones that have worked for me in the past. There's a link in the description. The second type of SQL injection attack is known as a union attack. The union operator is used to combine the results of multiple select statements. This means that we can add tables from other parts of the database to our query. This gives an attacker access to critical company data and can involve data theft, identity impersonation, and compliance breaches. For example, suppose we have a web application that has the following SQL query for searching through a library. In this case, an attacker could enter the following search term. The resulting SQL query would look like this. This query would return a table with the username and password columns from the users table and place them on top of the query results. An attacker could potentially obtain sensitive information about the users in the database. But how can we return the tables and columns from the database if we don't know what they're called? There are a few steps you have to follow, so I'll take you through them. I'm going to use MySQL for my example, but you can use pen testing monkeys cheat sheet for other types of SQL database. Step one, find the amount of columns we can attach a union to. As previously stated, the union operator is used to combine two or more select statements. This allows us to not only select data in the table that's returned to the front end of the web application, but also return data of another table in the database in a single query. The amount of columns selected in the union statement must match the table that we're joining onto. If the columns don't match, a union won't work. It's also important not to assume that all the columns we can see on the screen are all the columns in the table. The table may have hidden columns to help correlate primary and foreign keys or any other number of reasons. Don't assume that because we can see three columns that there isn't a hidden fourth column. We can find the amount of columns the original table has in two ways. The first uses the select operator to extend the amount of columns there are in the table. This would return a table that looks like this. We have to have the same amount of columns in the table we're joining onto or the query will return malformed. We can also use the order by operator in the same way. This would return a table that looks like this. Personally, I prefer the union select method as it just helps me visualize the query much better and also help with exploitation, but it's down to you to try them out. By directly querying and labeling each column as one, two, and three, we can see which fields will return data to us. For the purposes of this demonstration, all three columns will return data to us, but it is possible that not all of them will. We now have to determine information about the database version, table structure, and columns held in each table. Version information can be very useful for finding out if the release of the software has any known vulnerabilities. Different database technologies require different syntaxes for querying this information. In this example, we're using MySQL, and the version returned to us as known vulnerabilities. We have to determine the names of the tables in the database. Use pen testing monkeys cheat sheet to help determine syntax for dropping the database table schemas. In a database, the schema is considered to be the blueprint of the whole database. It stores information about items and tables that exist in the database. There's a table that exists in the information schema called information schema.tables. This contains information about all the tables that exist in the database. From here, we can sift through them looking for ones that stick out as interesting for private information or sensitive information. In this example, we are selecting the table name and table schema columns from the information schema.tables table. We can see general information about the tables in the database and their schemas. One sticks out in particular, the user information table. Now that we've determined the table we want to query, we need to find the columns in the table. We can use the information schema.columns table, which contains information about the columns in the table. Here, we're selecting the column name field from the information schema.columns table, where the table is user information. Again, to find information on standardized tables in a database, I'd recommend reading official documentation or using PentestMonkey's cheat sheet as the type of database and schema layout does vary between database management systems. Step three, read and alter information in the database. We now know the column names that we can query in the user information table to find a list of users and their hashed passwords for later attacks. Here, we're selecting the login ID, which will be the primary key of the table, the login name and the hashed password. From here, we could use our own cracking tools to crack the passwords, or we could update the existing records in the user information table to replace the credentials for the users with our own hashes. 
This, for example, would update the password of a previously generated MD5 hash for the password 1 equals 1. When we enter 1 equals 1 to the system for the admin user, it will scramble our password into MD5 hash format, and it will match with the stored hash on the database, returning as true that we are the admin user and granting us access. If you want to understand more granular details for updating tables, you can view this information on my GitHub at point 5 of my SQL injection cheat sheet. It's important to note that this technique only works if the attacker has sufficient permissions and access to the information schema.table and information schema.columns tables. Additionally, some web applications may be configured to block access to this table, in which case the attack won't be successful and other avenues should be explored. The last method is blind SQL injection. Blind SQL injection is a type of attack that we can execute valid SQL queries on the back end, but the results of the query are not returned to the screen on the front end, even if an error occurs. Before looking for blind SQL injection, I would first look for common methods that cause an error in the passing of data to the database. If no errors are returned, you can check for blind SQL injection with a sleep command. In this example, if the database takes 15 seconds to return any results to us, it could be an indication of a vulnerable SQL parameter. You can also output a script to a file on the machine. If there is a way of executing the script, such as storing it in the root web directory and running it, remote command execution or local file inclusion might be achievable. In this example, I'm using the PHP system function, which can be used to send commands directly to the underlying operating system. Once this has been stored in a file on the web server's root directory, we can directly visit and execute commands. I haven't covered all the steps and procedures I would take to check for SQL injection in this video, as it would take a very long time. I have made a bullet point cheat sheet on my GitHub where I cover a more extensive list of potential attack types as well as database deviations. It covers authentication bypass strings that have worked for me in the past, how to update and generate hashes, reading and writing local files, arbitrary command execution, and many more aspects of SQL injection. Another great resource and personal favourite of mine is a book by Carlos Pollock Martin, available for free called Hack Tricks. Hack Tricks is a great source and it's incredibly broad. I often find if I haven't heard of the protocol, I can find some information on here and enumerate it. I would often turn to this book before turning to official documentation and find everything I need to understand the protocol and its common attack paths. A link to his book and my SQL injection cheat sheet has been left in the video description. There are tools out there to help you find and exploit SQL injection attacks. Burp Suite is a great tool for bypassing client-side security restrictions and manually enumerating databases. SQL Map is a great tool for automatic enumeration and is so good in fact it's been banned from certain penetration testing exams. A map can also be used for SQL related parameters, but my personal favorite is something called Fuff. Fuff is a tool that's very useful for all things fuzzing and it actually stands for fuzz faster you fall. It's important to note, using these tools without proper authorization and permission can be illegal so do be sure that you're using them in a responsible and ethical manner. Thank you for watching this overview on SQL injection and its common attack types. If you would like a live demonstration of these types of SQL injection attack, do let me know in the comment section and I'll make a video on it. If you enjoyed this video or found it helpful, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel. I appreciate the support, especially as a new YouTuber, and I look forward to bringing you more content in the future.